imagine chemistry, but even smaller. You might think chemists have the monopoly on complex reactions, but you haven't met quantum chromophysicists. And yes, I just made that term up, but I promise it'll make sense. You've heard about electromagnetism. Arguably, this is the simplest of the four fundamental forces, which makes sense because it's what chemists study. <laughs> it also governs atomic and molecular interactions. But deep within the heart of an atom lies the nucleus, which is made up of protons and neutrons, and they have a chemistry all of their own. Meet the strong nuclear force, also sometimes called quantum chromodynamics. Just as the electromagnetic force reacts to one kind of charge, which comes in a positive and negative variety, the strong nuclear force reacts to three kinds of charges. Now, like in electromagnetism, opposite charges attract, but another way to think about this is that charges tend to neutralize. Think a positive charge canceling out a negative charge, resulting in zero. But for the strong nuclear force, there's another way the charges can neutralize aside from meeting their negative partner. The three different charges can come together and cancel out that way, too. And it's this property that has led to the name chromodynamics. In the additive theory of color, if you take red, green, and blue light and combine them all, you get white light, neutral, if you will. On the other hand, you can combine a color, say blue, with its opposite, which you might call either anti-blue or alternatively yellow, and you will also get to neutral. So we label each of the three charges of the strong nuclear force after the three additive primary colors. There's red, green, and blue charges, and each has a corresponding anti-charge, hence chromodynamics. Now this is all fine and dandy, but it doesn't tell us anything about the kinds of structures that can form. In electromagnetism, we learn that atoms can form because there are particles like protons that have positive charge and particles like electrons that have negative charge. Similarly, particles called quarks, of which there are six varieties, have one unit of color charge and antiquarks have one unit of anticolor charge. So we have the building blocks, quarks and antiquarks, now we just need to know the possible ways to put them together to end up with a neutral color charge. These combinations are called hadrons. The simplest kind of hadron is called a meson, and it's made by a quark and a perhaps different variety, antiquark, binding together. In this case, you have a color charge and its opposite cancel out. Alternatively, you can combine three quarks or three antiquarks to form a color neutral combination as well. These are called baryons, and the most common example is the proton. And now you can play games. What mesons are possible? What baryons are possible? How can two baryons interact to produce two different baryons, or perhaps three mesons, or more complicated combinations? That's the chemistry of quantum chromodynamics, and it's the purview of quantum chromophysicists. Unfortunately, the details of chromophysics are extremely complex. The strength of the neutralizing force is so strong that our typical method for approximation, called perturbation theory, just doesn't work. And this difficulty is compounded by the fact that the force-carrying particle for quantum chromodynamics, called the gluon, itself carries both a charge and an anti-color charge, so the force can cause more force. This is a feature that is completely absent in electromagnetism. So together with the extra complication of our inability to make simple approximations means that we rely very heavily on computer calculations to come to even the most crude predictions about the properties of the baryons that can form. And don't get me started on glue balls.